Good afternoon, friends, and uh, thank you to the organizers, especially to Dr. Agashe and Dr. Aditya Menon, who always consider me as part of their team. Uh, Dr. Agashe has just highlighted the importance of debridement when you suspect a surgical site infection, and I'm going to give you a few tips and tricks as to how to avoid negative cultures. When we see a wound like this, infection is really a no-brainer over here. And yet, when you get no growth on your cultures, on your intraoperative cultures, both for the surgical team as well as the patient especially, this is really the unkindest cut of all. We understand that the vital significance of a positive culture is in the fact that it avoids extrapolation of any sort, which is really too high a price to pay. Consider the futility of hospitalization and surgery that the patient has undergone, the morbidity of surgery for elderly patients who already have so many comorbid conditions, the collateral damage of guesswork antibiotics for these patients for a prolonged period of time, and not to mention the financial loss. Hence, targeted therapy really has the greatest chances of success. And if we were to think about it, it's really the three P's in the perioperative period, planning, preparation, and persistence, which take us far in you know, getting positive cultures, starting way into the preoperative period and extending into the postoperative period. So if we were to start with our preoperative planning and preparation, everything starts with a thorough history, an antibiotic-free period for as long as possible, communication and referral to the entire team that's involved, and preparation for appropriate sample collection. Let's go through these in a little more detail. So as an ID physician, I always say that history is my only procedure. And this should really be the first procedure, regardless of you know, where you are and what you start with. On the right are some of my registrar's notes and our copious arduous histories that we take, which take into account the comorbid conditions, the immune status, residence, occupation, travel, exposure, uh, recreational drugs, and all these go a long way in giving us clues as to what the potential pathogen might be and what we could test for instead of blanket testing. An ideal antibiotic-free period for at least two weeks is what is recommended for most patients. However, we understand that there are contraindications, really sick patients, septic patients, patients with significant purulent discharge, impending abscesses, skin and soft tissue, necrotizing infections, immunosuppressed patients, and it's in these patients that you might actually want to um, consider reducing that antibiotic-free period or using other methods of mitigation of uh, negative cultures. Communication goes a long way, and this needs to start way before surgery. It helps you to identify what the likely organisms might be based on that specific history that we just discussed, as well as set out specific samples, transport media that you might need from the laboratory in advance. Even think about prolonged incubations when you're suspecting atypical pathogens. So not just incubations of five days, but incubations that may progress to 14 days in your laboratory. And this might need to be communicated well in advance. Appropriate sample collection, we know that it's mostly in our sterile leak-proof containers and you need multiple of these for all sorts of samples, including small parts of your hardware. Multiple samples, more than three and minimum of three and at least five to six, with clear labeling, and I cannot re-emphasize the need for this. As a physician, for me, for an example, whether the tissue is in an amputated tissue, whether it's organism is coming from an excised stump, the proximal stump, or medullary canal go a long way in helping me decide the duration of antibiotics. All the other cultures, molecular tests, histopathology, everything can go in these uh, sterile leak-proof containers, including sonication of small hardware parts. When we look at chronic infections, patients who have been receiving long-term antibiotics or who have been recurrently on antibiotics recently, uh, we have started using Bactec bottles, and we found that both the yield of cultures as well as the duration to a culture is reduced significantly when we inoculate our pus and blood directly into Bactec bottles. In patients who are still on an antibiotic at the time of surgery, you can even go for a Bactec Plus bottle, which has specific resins that inhibit antibiotics. If you want to make enemies with your microbiologist, please continue to send swabs. This is something that irritates them to no end, surgeons telling them that they are bucketfuls of pus and still what they receive is a swab. We know that the concordance between swabs and deep tissue specimens is very poor, and these swabs are not useful and often misleading. They are an absolute no-no. 
Moving on to our intraoperator strategy, ideal site, ideal tests, sampling and transport. So if we start with the ideal sample site, and this is guided by Dr. Agashe and Dr. Menning, superficial to the implant is where you take your first samples from, avoiding samples from within the sinus tract. Of course, the sinus tract should be sent for histopath. Samples again deep to the implant and over the bone, making sure that you remove the biofilm over the bone or mass. And finally, from the area of non-union or the medullary canal while you're reaming scraping. Ideal tests, of course, there should be input from your medical team as well as your microbiologists. We send a smear for all patients understanding fully well that this gives us a rapid detection of organisms, GPC, GNB, fungal filaments, acid fast bacilli, and also gives us an idea of the inoculum. How high is the inoculum? If you have it on smear, you know that these organisms are there in a large number. Aerobic cultures are always sent. Anaerobic cultures must be sent, especially in open injuries, soil contaminated wounds, foul smelling pus. Fungal cultures, again, similar patients, immunocompromised. Gene expert is a molecular test for TB, gives us an idea of resistance. And very important to remember that it's negative in NTM infections. So if you have a positive acid fast bacillus on smear and a negative gene expert, you must think of NTM infections, especially in patients who have undergone previous surgery or had soil contamination. TB midget, NTM cultures, and finally histopathology, which has to be sent regardless. Both gives us pyogenic granulomatous background as well as helping us differentiate infective from non-infective. If you're sampling a culture on the same day, you needn't add any additive. The next day, a few drops of saline to keep it moist is a good idea. For histopathology, the sample can go in formalin. Finally, for in the post-operate period, this is where persistence comes in. Please note down the pending investigations and hand them over to the patient on discharge. Counsel the patients about prolonged incubation and TB cultures that are still expected and keep the lines of communication on with your physician, ID team, microbiologist. I can't tell you how many cultures, how many different organisms have come in even after a patient has been discharged. And my take home messages are, begin with a good history, that's our first essential procedure, pre-operative antibiotic free period as far as possible, communication teamwork is an absolute must. The key is appropriate tests collected and transported appropriately and post-op follow-up and communication with the team goes a long way. Finally, although we all grumble, the price of a no growth is much, much greater than the price of multiple appropriately collected samples. And I'll leave you with the three P's of success. Thank you.